CPD Online, as some of you may know and some might not, is a on-demand video site for lawyers to get their required CPD credits. Um, I'm going to just share my screen and show you the site just quickly here. And I am cognizant of time. There we go. But here's the home screen of CPD Online. And uh, it's easy to navigate. Click the law videos. And it's easy to source content. And the content comes from sister associations, such as Toronto Lawyers Association, uh, CCLA in Ottawa, MLA in London. And I'm hoping to attract back some of our pre-pandemic content providers, uh, Frontenac and Halton, I'm thinking of you. And I'm also hoping to attract some new associations to share content and share in the very generous 50-50 royalty, royalty split. And I'm thinking specifically of Thunder Bay, Sudbury, Essex, we've had conversations and I'd like to continue those. Um, another reminder that I think is very important, particularly for the cash strapped associations, which I think we all are, is that they, for each member who purchases a subscription, which is $3.99, and that just gets purchased here, $3.99, we pay each and every association $100 per member subscription. And that includes a $100 payment when they renew their subscription come year end. So there's a, a real financial upside to having your members join CPD online to get their required CPD credits. And the content could not be better. It comes from you. And that's my time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. And thank you so much to CPD online for your sponsorship today, but also your continued partnership with associations. We appreciate that. Thank you. Um, to, to take us into the next session, I'm going to turn the floor back to Alan Weinperl, who is our library committee chair and our second vice chair of FOLA. Um, Alan, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, I have to get my microphone off before <coughs> I uh, go any further. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, so uh, I hope we all had a little bit of uh, nutrition over that break, but we need to get back to it because we have uh, some important issues uh, uh, affecting our uh, associations, all of us. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion initially. Um, do I have a Carolyn Nevin? Carolyn? Thank you so, so much. And Carolyn is the CEO of uh, BC Courthouse Libraries. And she's gonna give us a little bit of information about how the associations out in, uh, in British Columbia work, which is just great. And then um, also, oh my, over here, sorry. Give me one second. Who, uh, who, Rosalind who and Karen are speaking from CCLA and MLA. Wonderful. So, okay, so maybe um, what we'll do is uh, we'll just uh, we're going to have some brief opening comments now by everybody. So maybe what we'll do is we'll just start with uh, uh, Carolyn in the issue of, of public access to um, the courthouse libraries. Great. Thanks so much for inviting me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so you'll see from my bio that I've spent the last 25 years trying to find ways to support lawyers who need help in the practice of law. And my personal passionate uh, focus really is on rural and small and solo firms. Those are the people who need so much more help in leveling up. Um, and uh, I think that large law firms in general have a lot more resources. And so um, I have nothing but compassion. Uh, for everyone who's who's operating in any system where you don't have community or support. Um, in my experience, every lawyer needs some help managing this career. It's um, isolating and community really is the most important thing. So I know the work that you do in your local bar associations is very important. And um, I know that it's sometimes thankless, if not actually griefful. So um, I uh, appreciate your time and volunteer energy and thank you for that. I also come from a province that had horrific flooding uh, six months ago. I'm sure you saw the pictures. Um, and it's provided the best example I've ever seen of why 
municipal and re regional authorities with their small individual tax bases can't efficiently or effectively manage bigger issues outside of their geographic borders. The reality is the reason the water basin got flooded was because management of the factors that could have contained it spanned multiple jurisdictions and two countries. So I've always seen local bar associations as absolutely essential, but I've always thought that some things like services everyone needs or advocacy on big issues requires a partially centralized approach to be effective. And I can elaborate on the partial part in the breakout room later. But I like Doug's description of law libraries as being part of the origin story of law association. So 150 years ago, the Law Society of BC was formed. Their very first act was to create a law library. And if, of course, it was in the in New Westminster, which was the center of the world in BC at the time. And then local bar associations had to fight to get their little piece of the pie and get some books in their community for their lawyers. And um, actually, surprisingly, I think quickly, it was um, viewed as something that uh, the input into what books and what services should be there should come from a local bar association, but there was an overriding organization behind it. So I think I, I have a bit of a history to, to rely on that you guys don't, and I recognize that. But I do think it's important to note that so originally there was a $50 fee to be a lawyer in BC, $10 of which went to law libraries. Now, I would be thrilled to get 20% of uh, the law society's fee this day and age, but actually now with inflation, people are paying a much lower cost. And I want to give you a couple of reasons why. First, we centralized a lot of the collective costs that individual law associations had in running libraries, mass buying power, legal publications and IT services, professional staff to manage the organization and professional development, and useful programs that we were able to negotiate, for example, with Canada Post around, we deliver and lawyers mail back any book in our legal pro in, in any library in the province free of charge because we are a public law library. Um, and about 50 years ago, we started to attract funding from the Law Foundation, which gets its interest from client funds and trust accounts, as I'm sure you know. It meant opening up our services to the public, but in truth, what happened was we started serving people more outside of our library than in. So it wasn't like we had this influx of people who come in. The only people who come to courthouses are people who really are forced to come into courthouses. They have a form to file, they have something to do. There's the, the majority of our services are, uh, we operate an online library of public legal education and information, PLEI, that is produced by other people. So we help people find that information. Lawyers send clients and um, people they can't help to that website and so it's a it's a really nice feature for lawyers because they can they can send people away but with something in hand um, and we provide training and resources to intermediaries so public librarians uh, public librarians legal advocates anywhere where a pub member of the public might come in so again we're sort of second hand on serving the public but 50 percent of our funding comes from being able to say that we serve the public I just wanted to uh, say that because I have a feeling that some people think that opening up to the public means, um, I'm gonna say this only here, the great unwashed. Somehow there's gonna be this mass of people who come in off the street as is true in public libraries, which I totally understand. I understand what you're talking about. But in reality, the service to the public is about primarily outside of the library, inside of the library. It is essential, not just for the public, but for solo small firms technology has become such a big deal and we have public computers and public hearing rooms and places for people to use public technology including lawyers and i think that's been fully funded not by the law society necessarily but primarily by the law foundation and the notary foundation so i know i had less time than that i have lots more points i hope you join us in the breakout rooms thank you Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Really appreciate that. And uh, now I think Roslyn and Karen are going to speak a little bit about um, a, a little bit more restrictive access, uh, talking about a paralegal access to both the libraries and the association itself. And, and so I'll, I'll leave that to, to you guys. Thanks, Alan. 
Um, so my name is Karen Newlin. Um, I am the president of the Middlesex Law Association. Uh, we don't have uh, paralegal members who, uh, as part of our association, and uh, I, I have been aware that that's been an issue, but it's not uh, truthfully in the in the time that I've been involved uh, with the board over the last ten or eleven years. It's not really something that we've heard a lot about. Um, our exploration of this topic really started this year, earlier this winter when we received a letter from one of our um, fellow associations here in Ontario, who was introducing to us a paralegal who practices both in that jurisdiction as well as in London. And the request was being made that uh, with full knowledge that we don't have paralegal access to our association or to our practice resource center, would we be please consider uh, granting access to that individual. So that's really what's prompted uh, a series of conversations that we have been having. I, I first took this matter to the Southwest region full uh, meeting that we had to see what our colleagues are doing in Southwestern Ontario and wasn't really surprised that um, what I was hearing was similar to our own experience and it really just was one-off requests that were made from time to time. One of the issues, of course, is that as lawyers, we are all paying a uh, levy for our practice resource centers, and I think it's in the tune of 181 or 183. So it's just north of $180, and paralegals do not pay that levy. So I have learned in my uh, conver uh, conversations that I've had with um, both with the Southwest groups, as well as uh, other associations in, in Ontario who do have paralegal access, about the various workarounds that, they, that they've had to, to uh, make up for the fact that paralegals aren't paying the levy. And for instance, one of them is, is that they have a higher um, uh, membership rate, or they have a membership rate plus a, law, um, a levy to pay directly to that local library to offset the cost. Um, I mean, I think that there's a real disadvantage to paralegals who are practicing in more, in more than one jurisdiction, and it, it's potentially unfair to them in a way that is not fair, uh, that lawyers don't have to deal with, and that is if we are doing this as piecemeal across the province, then, and, uh, and charging additional rates to paralegals to access our resources, our resource centers, then, uh, then they, they are uh, looking at higher fees than we're paying. And so this is what prompted me to call a few associations in, in Ontario, including uh, Carlton's Association, uh, speaking with uh, Rick Hega and Roslyn Conway about their experience. And it has been 15 years now that paralegals have been licensed, um, legal practitioners with the Law Society. And why is it that we have this hodgepodge across the province about um, paralegal access? So part of trying to inform myself and, and inform our board, we uh, reached out to a senior lawyer in our jurisdiction who's a former venture, who I know this topic has been near and dear to his heart for some time. I've had conversations with the Law Society treasurer about this matter as well as ventures and have made it clear that, you know, the, the perspective that I'm hearing and, and uh, from, from colleagues is that, um, there's no free ride. That if, if paralegals are going to have access to the practice resource centers, then the law society at some point is going to have to address this and, uh, and, and ensure that there, there is some sort of levy comparable, maybe at a reduced rate, but comparable to what it is that lawyers are paying for this. And, and I think that the law society and certainly the speak, people who I was speaking with understand that, including paralegal benchers who I who I've, have spoken to about this matter. Um, so what we this where we are now here locally, um, our bylaws do not uh, permit paralegals. So we we are looking at um, looking at our bylaws and any procedure for amending those bylaws. But backing it up even further, uh, we did do a poll of our membership last month, and we left it over open for about a week. Um, we actually had some pretty good uh, response rates immediately. And that continued over the course of the week. And I have to say that, uh, generally speaking, the uh, I, the the results are favorable to uh, granting access to paralegals, not only access to the to the uh, sorry to the practice resource center for a fee, but also uh, granting access to our association 
and we will be looking at uh, what their role would be on the board, on the executive, those sorts of questions. So uh, our next steps, uh, next week, we're having our, our monthly board meeting. Uh, we're going to be discussing this matter and, and, and determining whether or not we need to do more consultation with our membership. Uh, and if so, with what that would look like, would it be in the format of a town hall? Um, but so we're, it's, it's well underway. Um, and, and I encourage you uh, today in the breakout rooms that we have a fruitful conversation. And I'd like to hear from everybody about the, uh, what your association has been doing um, on this issue. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rosalind now because uh, Carlton has been uh, kind of a leader in this area for many, many years. Thank you very much, Karen. So yes, I'm speaking to you from Ottawa um, and I'll be speaking primarily about paralegals. The uh, County of Carleton Law Association in Ottawa has had paralegal members uh, since 2014. We have a paralegal committee. It hosts programming every year. Uh, uh, they have paralegal day, other events. Uh, it's advocacy focused and they have programs on special topics such as appearing before tr uh, particular tribunals, opening your paralegal practice, drafting pleadings. We have encouraged uh, paralegals to send their chair of their committee or a designate to our board meetings, and they've been making valuable contributions to our discussions for some years now. We charge the paralegals um, a lower fee for membership, lower than lawyers, and in fact, we, we wound up reducing it some time ago, and it's only $150 a year. It reflects that they have a different type of membership. They can now vote for a paralegal trustee because we now have a paralegal trustee and that trustee will sit on our board for two years. So we have our first paralegal trustee. However, the paralegal trustee cannot ascend to the executive or become president of our association, but the two year term gives them some continuity. And that's something that we actually just put into place for all of our board members. We have long had in Ottawa a collegial relationship between paralegal members and and the lawyer members of our association. And the benefits to us are that we have a larger membership, we have a more diverse membership, uh, more cohesive and collegial gatherings, and the paralegals have shown great appreciation of our inclusivity. A perennial concern of the paralegals in Ottawa has been their lack of access to other libraries in the East Region when they go to courthouses outside of Ottawa. And as Karen said, the paralegals do not pay a library levy. I thought the levy was about $217 and maybe it's been reduced. I, I, I was just quickly trying to check, but they, it's quite correct. They don't pay a levy, but I've discussed it with them. And at least in our region, there is, or in Ottawa, there's support for paying a levy. They would, they would not be objecting to that. So that would be a, a bonus to everyone if they start paying into um, the, uh, the library system. Now, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, we, we really have some very, very accomplished paralegals here in Ottawa. For example, Paula Callahan is the recipient of the 2022 William J. Simpson Distinguished Paralegal Award. That's the Law Society Award. And um, Jennifer Gra Gravel Vanas is receiving our CCLA Paralegal Award this year. I'll, I'll just touch briefly on public access. This is something that we've permitted for, for quite a long time. Uh, and we continue to permit public access. And we had a library renovation that Yasser Nakvi uh, assisted us in obtaining funding for. And it, part of that um, memorandum of, of understanding with the province is that there would be public access. So we have both public and paralegal access. Um, so that's what I wanted to add to the discussion today. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karen and Rosalind. Appreciate uh, your your perspective, and I'm sure we're going to have a good conversation in our uh, in our breakout rooms. So let me just talk to you a little bit about um, <clears throat> uh, what I've been working on. I um, uh, was appointed um, the the chair of our committee for the practice resource centers uh, through FOLA uh, recently, and have. Um, uh, reconstituted the the committee uh, that FOLA has run, which was previously known, I think, as the Library Committee. Um, you heard um, Teresa Leach uh, um, 
just before lunch tell you about an upcoming consultation on the roles and descriptions of uh, library staff. And I just wanna to talk to you about that for a few minutes. Um, you were not provided with those roles or descriptions um, that uh, is in a draft form already through LEARN um, because uh, Teresa Leach has asked us not to disclose those until they go to her board and at least get a preliminary approval uh, for those roles and descriptions. So that's why you don't have that. We had hoped that you would have that for today, but uh, regardless, we think it's important to start informing our members about those uh, roles and descriptions which are, are being put forward by uh, LEARN uh, at this point. So the information that we have, uh, I'll just generally describe that uh, the, the roles and descriptions that they are focusing on are uh, three levels of librarian. I'll call them the entry level, the intermediate uh, librarian, and then the supervisor librarian. And I'm not going to go into describing um, how they uh, describe these uh, work roles. I, I would say to you thus far, I have not heard uh, a lot of objection to how they've um, they've described those. I know that these have been circulated to librarians um, through the working group with Learn uh, and to some others uh, briefly. And I, I don't know that anybody's really objecting to what's in the document. It's more what's not in the document, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, there is also described two levels of library administrator. Um, these are more in what I'll call the library technician role, the full-time and the part-time technician role. And again, I'm not going to go into you about the, the chapter and verse about each of these roles. Uh, I hope that very soon the actual document that Teresa referred to in her uh, talk with you earlier uh, will be disclosed to everyone, you know, and I apologize for uh, not being able to disclose that to you. And I recognize that that puts the presidents uh, at a bit of a disadvantage. But I think that this uh, conversation is still very important because um, uh, Doug, Katie and myself met about a month ago with Teresa Leach to review these descriptions as they existed at that point. And um, we have uh, some concerns and certainly others who have seen the draft um, have, have raised some concerns about what the roles do not describe. So, for example, the, uh, this, this document does not describe who the library staff reports to. Um, I think most of us at this meeting would agree that the library staff report to the association boards. That is the point of the association boards at least at their, at their origin, at their genesis. Um, it also does not um, uh, describe that library staff have a role in supporting uh, association governance, board meetings, executive meetings, library committee meetings, nomination committee meetings, AGMs. It does not describe that. Um, the library uh, staff uh, has not, uh, at least in this description, been given uh, a role in supporting current awareness of association members. Uh, library staff has not been given any role in supporting association CPD, despite the fact that LEARN is responsible for, and I quote, modernizing the delivery of legal information and library services by county law libraries. Um, the question we have preliminarily raised is, does uh, the delivery of legal information include associations delivering CPD? That's certainly a discussion point for our group uh, when, when you meet with us um, for our 20 minutes. Uh, and library staff hasn't been given a role in these descriptions, but that are created by LEARN. Uh, in library security. So um, I certainly know that in some libraries, uh, Hamilton is my home library, um, staff have um, obligations with respect to perhaps reviewing surveillance after hours uh, attendant on after hours attendances or other issues. And, and that is not completely described. It's partially described, but not completely described in the roles that had LEARN have set out. So um, why is all of this important? Um, you know, these are a guideline. There, no one is going to be bound and handcuffed to these guidelines. Why is it important that we talk about these guidelines and get on, uh, get an understanding of what's going on here? Well, 
um, the the libraries will only be funded according to these job descriptions. Anything outside of these job descriptions is not going to be funded. It's going to be association uh, work, and that's what's not going to be funded by Learn going forward. And uh, we'll also talk a little bit about how um, uh, how uh, Teresa Leach and Learn are going to get enough information to determine what librarians are doing. So that's what we're going to be talking about in our group, and I'll leave it at that for now. So I think that that uh, uh, completes our preliminary uh, panel discussion, and and I think that the next step is that we're we're going to split the groups into three. Um, you're, uh, a group of you are going to go with Carolyn and Roslyn, a group of you are going to go with Carolyn Le Nevin, and then a, a group of you are going to come with Rebecca Bantham and myself. But I got to be honest with you, I don't know how that's all processing. Yes, so um, for everyone who's got uh, their, right, their law association from the letter A to um, what did I say to Peterborough? Oh no, to Hastings, sorry, are going into the paralegal access learn session first. That's group A for you. Public access are the next people in the alphabet. So that is, I've got so many things up on my screen, I can't see. Um, between Huron and Peterborough, and then Prescott Russell uh, will be group, the third group on that list for learn and you will be first joining that group. So you can all go ahead and click on join to your respective groups. Please do that now. And in about 20 minutes, I'll, well, a little under that, I'll give you a two minute warning. And then you'll come back to the main room and join the next group on your list. Sound good? The session um, leaders can all go to your rooms now and you'll be staying there for the entirety. <laughs> 